Welcome to a special holiday edition of Power and Politics. I'm David Cochran. From a cost of living crisis to allegations of foreign interference to the most destructive Canadian wildfire season ever recorded, there's been no shortage of major breaking news. And now you'll get a behind the scenes look at what it was like to cover those stories. We've asked for your questions and we're going to try to get through as many as possible. And joining me now to answer those questions, a group of journalists who've appeared on Power and Politics many, many, many times throughout the year. In Calgary, we've got Elise Von Schiel. In Washington, it's Katie Simpson. And here with me in Ottawa, Rosemary Barton, Rafi Bujikanian, and Catherine Cullen. Happy holidays. Welcome, everyone. Thanks Happy for holidays. joining us today. Hi. All right, we're going to start by honing in on one topic that has been top of mind for all Canadians in 2023, and we're going to get the help of CBC's senior business correspondent, Peter Armstrong. I'm Peter Armstrong in Toronto, and the biggest story, the most important story I covered this year was the cost of living crisis. Every other story we did either revolved around or was seen through the lens of how this cost of living crisis was impacting Canadians right across the country. Whether it's a slowing GDP or a moderating jobs market or inflation slowly coming back to earth but still way too high with a double whammy of increased borrowing costs, they were all seen through that lens of a cost of living crisis. And in a lot of ways, 2023, was a surprisingly resilient economy as that cost of living crisis got worse. And I think in, in a lot of ways, 2024 might be the inverse of that, where we see the cost of living crisis begin to show some progress as CPI comes back under control and interest rates maybe start to come back down at a time when the economy now really might begin to suffer. They say the difference between a, a downturn is when your neighbor loses his job and a recession is when you lose your own job. And I think we're going to see that come to the fore as we start to look at all these data with that slightly different version of that same lens through 2024. Okay, so Rosie, this was your top story of the year. I think a lot of people's top story of yeah. the year. Why'd you pick this one? Because I think it resonates the most with Canadians versus anything else, perhaps, that we will talk about. You can all fight me about that later, but, I, <laughs> I, but that, that's my feeling. And, and for a myriad of factors, first of all, because inflation is, is still too high, although it's tracked considerably down, of course, over the course of the year. Interest rates remain at 5%. They've, they were increased again through the year, but the Bank of Canada chose to pause them. Obviously, those two things are co correlated, right? right. If, you, if you keep your interest rates high, your inflation goes down. But mostly because I think it is the area where Canadians are struggling the most in all sorts of ways. Food prices, um, their mortgages, finding a rental of a, a property that's affordable. And because I think it's the area where the Liberal government has struggled the most. It took, I would say, half the year before um, they started to respond to what Canadians were feeling and saying and started to respond to what Conservatives were doing to them. And I was pummeling them day after day on mm -hmm. this issue of affordability. And I would say even as this year ends and the government has tried to regain back some of that narrative, perhaps successfully, it is still Pierre Poiliev who is seen as the person who is fighting for Canadians on these issues. So, so, Catherine, on that point, uh, Pierre Polyev has had a laser focus on this issue. It's, it's what his preamble is for every single thing he does in public. You know, it always comes back to affordability. Uh, and well, and you, you look all the way back to the beginning of the Conservative leadership. He really has had his finger on the pulse on the issue of housing in particular. I will say talking about how the people who are building the f homes can't necessarily afford to live in them, which is something that resonates, I think, across party lines. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, the reason this issue is so troublesome for the government, yes, Pierre Polyev is part of it, but is because as Peter said, people are feeling this in their own lives, right? I mean, you just have to go to the grocery store, as we all do, and see um, the cost of groceries, feel the impact of all of it. And you can see, as Rosie said, how the government has become increasingly seized with that issue. The Prime Minister told Rosie, not all that long ago, about a year ago now, uh, you know, that they didn't want to push uh, grocery store CEOs. They weren't interested right. in an excise tax. They've had to turn themselves around on this because people are really feeling the pinch and there's this public pressure. So, so Rafi, on that, they're trying to deal with grocery store issues and trying to get them to sign up for a code of conduct. I, I don't know if you want to try to answer this question we got from Mark O'Connor. Why are grocery prices going up at an annual rate of more than 10 percent when the national inflation rate is coming down? Well, I don't know that I 100 percent know that, but I would say if you look at some of the rhetoric from the political parties on, on the left, it could be because of profits from grocery mm -hmm. stores. That's the thing that the NDP has tried to capitalize on a lot, and it, it almost sort of has seemed like the NDP, which is the party you would traditionally think of as, as the party that's like, you know, arguing for, um, you know, lower prices or, or more benefits to Canadians and the friends of the working class. They've sort of been 
muscled out by the conservatives right. on that territory. And that's certainly the argument they've been making. They tried to make a big show of uh, summoning the, the grocery store CEOs to committee. And right. it was mm -hmm. sort of funny because it looked like their, those invitations got lost in the mail and the CEOs didn't end up coming the first time around. We'll see where that debate goes. But. I mean, one of the things to consider, David, the cost of everything is still going up, right? The inflation right. It's, it's the rate of inflation. Everything is getting more expensive. No, it's not just you. It's just that the rate of food inflation is higher than the general rate of inflation. And we are seeing that rate of inflation decline. But again, I think because yeah. it is so visceral, there are uh, specific products where people really feel that they're feeling that pinch. Um, it's been very front and center. And as Rafi said, it's been very politicized Can, can I just well. say there's a handful of reasons too, yeah. right? The, uh, supply shortage, we're still suffering from the pandemic. Crop issues in different parts of the world, climate change, uh, labor supplies, geopolitical factors in Ukraine and Russia. I mean, it's way more complicated for food yeah. than it is for a bunch of other. Yeah, interest industries. rates deal with the demand side of things That's domestically. Right. It's supply shocks. Uh, in a lot of cases in groceries, and that's why it's up, right? War in Ukraine and drought around the world. Uh, Elise, uh, Alberta, we, we've, we've spoken with uh, your premier and your ministers many times talking about uh, federal policies uh, affecting the cost of living. How, how is this narrative playing out in, in Alberta? Well, I mean, it's much of what you would see across the country as well. And, you know, you had our, my, my colleagues over there talking about people being unable to afford the homes that they're living in or the homes that they've built. The other issue that we're talking about a lot out here, and it's happening across the country in Atlantic Canada, too, is the cost to heat and power those homes. And so I think you see that affordability question playing out in so many ways. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the cost of groceries as well, that's something that you feel right away, right? A lot of people have that line item budgeted to a T. And so if you see that go up by 20 bucks or 50 bucks, you can start to feel that um, in a really, really tangible way. And we've seen the government have to pivot from that, right? From going to saying, you know, is housing really federal jurisdiction? Maybe we need to talk to the cities and the provinces about it to now really going forward with those policies as we've seen the conservatives make um, make some headway and make some ground with voters on those positions and right. the same way that you're now seeing in my province my premier taking advantage of the fact that um, the issue of heating and the issue of a carbon tax and what that's costing people to heat their homes uh, run their cars and everything else i think you're seeing uh, the the political opponents of this federal government finally finding ways to kind of move into the cracks on these issues. Katie, what's your take on how it's playing out in the United States? I mean, Joe Biden has a pretty good economy, but like a lot of incumbent governments around the world, cost of living and anxiety about the future, it's hammering him, at least in terms of public opinion polls. <laughs> The cost of living crisis in the United States is absolutely atrocious, as you are seeing in Canada as well. Um, we are seeing the gap between the rich and the poor expand even further. And people who are in the middle class that is still being hollowed out are finding so incredibly difficult to be able to afford groceries, to be able to afford gas, even though all of the numbers are headed in the right direction. The Biden, the White House, uh, keeps pointing to all of these numbers heading in the right direction, saying, listen, uh, we, are, we have a strong growth economy. Uh, and Biden even staked part of his re-election campaign around it, describing it as Bidenomics. But so many people in that middle class, uh, they are not feeling the effects of things getting better. Interest rates have absolutely just eaten up the salaries, the incomes of so many people in America that the Biden administration or the Biden re-election campaign team, they've actually decided to drop the phrase Bidenomics because it wasn't resonating and average voters were not feeling that the th that things are getting better. The, the, the sense in the United States that the, the polls are suggesting that many American voters feel life is harder and more expensive and that is inflation and the cost of living crisis. Okay, Rosie, just bring it back to you for a final point. Uh, it, it's affecting incumbents everywhere. Yep. We've seen big swings in a lot of elections around the world. This government here, they need the next interest rate decision to be a rate cut in the worst possible way. Yeah, I mean, in spite of the various kinds of policies that we've seen them put in place responding to the criticism, whether it be the housing accelerator fund or getting grocery prices to stabilize somewhat over the next uh, six to 12 months and things like that, mm. their biggest hope, 100%, is that interest rates start to stabilize, even drop slightly, the inflation continues to go down, and that they can eke out a bit of growth uh, from the economy. That that is, that is really what they're relying on, I think, to start start to get the tide to turn for them. Okay. Up next, the Canadian wildfires this season this year was the most destructive ever recorded. Our reporters answer your questions about the politics of climate change. Next.
time, Juanita Taylor in Rankin and Nunavut, but it was in the Northwest Territories where the story that dominated this year was the unprecedented wildfire season that led to mass evacuations and destruction, prompting many questions about how governments at all levels should be responding to the very real issue of climate change. Welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics, and today we're answering your questions on the top political stories of the year using viewer questions sent to us by email. Here with me are Elise Van Schiel, Katie Simpson, Rosemary Barton, Catherine Cullen, and Rafi Bujikanian. Now that clip from our colleague Juanita Taylor really captured one of the biggest stories of the year, wildfires that impacted communities right across the country, forcing wide-scale evacuations and destruction. And we heard this for many people who wrote in. Frank Jenkins from Edmonton says, for me, the top story of 2023 in terms of global significance is climate change resulting from global warming. All right, Catherine, climate change, the political response, that was your top story of the year. Why do you pick this one? Yeah, I think because it resonates on every level, starting with those stories, as uh, Juanita was talking about, about uh, the fires and covering that this summer. I mean, I still think about some of those people who were trying to flee their homes with very little notice or, uh, you know, were away from their homes trying to figure out whether or not they had been burnt down. The courage of the people who were fighting those fires, incredibly compelling human stories. Mm -hmm. Also, though, all of this, the politics of climate change is something we are talking about day in and day out. So whether you're talking about the relationship between um, the federal government and the provinces, look at the pushback from Alberta and Saskatchewan when it comes to some of the questions around trying to reduce emissions, uh, or the carbon tax, right? Something we're hearing about every day in question periods. Certainly the question of the Liberal government's decision to put in place a carbon tax carve-out on home heating oil. Mm -hmm. That was a big political moment this year. Uh, the Liberals are facing pressure on both sides, both from the Conservatives calling on them to axe the tax, and some of the environmental movement who feel that they weakened a signature policy. So definitely a major issue this year. Well, as luck would have it, we have a political reporter from Alberta here with us today. <laughs> uh, Elise, this is also, in, in many ways, it, it's an economic story, it's an interprovincial story, it's a climate story, it's a human story. Yeah, it, it, was, it was my top story as well, and exactly how the, the provinces and the federal government have kind of shifted the relationship or the tension here, where a lot of times you see the provinces kind of nattering off in the corner, and Ottawa says, okay, we'll see you in court, we'll talk about it later kind of thing, versus this year, whether it was the... Um, Supreme Court's decision on the Impact Assessment Act and ruling that that was largely unconstitutional and how it determined what the federal government had jurisdiction over, whether it was the federal court decision on the single-use plastics. You've now got a position where the provinces who are fighting back on this have actually gained a little bit of momentum and have a little bit of um, the upper hand, if you will, on at least public opinion on some of this stuff, right? If people can't afford to heat their homes, they're maybe not going to be uh, worried so much about exactly what percentage emissions are going to be reduced by by 2030. And so you've got this position where we've gone from Alberta, um, the, the federal ministers, Stephen Gilbeau, for example, saying, you know, Alberta is not being a good partner on this, to them admitting when they were kind of releasing this oil and gas emissions cap framework last week, that they had actually tailored it and kind of tweaked it to try to avoid any issues that might come up with the federal, uh, with the with the provinces. But I don't know that any tweaks would have been enough for Danielle mm -hmm. Smith. You know, you've got Saskatchewan uh, out here essentially saying we aren't going to collect a carbon tax here. And Alberta hates it when Saskatchewan says, hold my beer. And so I think you're going to see kind of this, this escalation because Alberta and the provinces feel like they have the public behind them in Alberta, maybe in a way that they didn't have right. the public behind them for a pension plan or for a sovereignty act, that they've got public opinion behind them in an effort to kind of go forward on a, a policy that is environmental, but that has affordability implications as well. I, 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 would, I would just maybe disagree, push back a little bit about where the story is. That's where the story is. I, I would caution about where the story is going. Right. We, we've had, um, you know, th at least three federal elections on climate change uh, and, and issues around climate change. And in those elections, the vast majority of Canadians have voted for parties that, that have clear plans to fight climate change. Uh, I think right now Canadians have put that lower on their list because of what Elise says there, and that's issues around affordability and how they pay for things. As those issues fade away, as they naturally will with the cycle of the economy, I wonder whether climate change doesn't creep back up there. And if I was a conservative right now, I'd be very conscious of the fact that I'm going to need to have a really clear plan to fight climate change to put in the window. Because just hoping that people will think it's not as big a deal as it was before because they've got issues around affordability probably isn't strong, a strong enough mm -hmm. political strategy. Well, well Katie, you, you know, you're in Washington now, but you and I started here in Ottawa roughly around the same time in 2016, and that was the year of the great consensus on this, right? When 
when the premiers came together in, in Vancouver and, and had the initial deal on climate and then they finalized it later that year in Ottawa. And, and now we're seeing a disagreement over the use of carbon pricing and the Biden administration has taken a totally different approach. Rather than punishing you for polluting, they're offering incentives to invest in green tech. And there's a real contrast there in how the two countries are approaching this. Uh, David, I'm old enough to remember when the speculation in Ottawa was Justin Trudeau was going to set the example for the world on how you win an election campaigning on a carbon tax and that this was going to be the gold standard moving forward. And that was, oh, so many years ago, it seems now. I've only been gone for four years. Yeah. But, um, uh, in the United States, uh, Joe Biden is really going to really need to win over progressive voters. And he's got a number of challenges with progressive voters right now. And one of the things uh, that the Democrats offer a very very stark change or a op different option when it comes to climate change related issues uh, than the Republicans do. And this is something expect to see Joe Biden to continue to lean into this heading into the next election cycle. Uh, but of course, this has been a big focus. Uh, progressive would say not big enough, uh, but it is mm -hmm. something that the Biden administration has focused on. Uh, many of the aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act are green energy initiatives, green initiatives. So it's something the Biden administration has paid attention to, but expect right. Joe Biden or and the Democrats to give another nod to it moving forward because it's a big election year. You, you know, Rafi, uh, you, you came to Ottawa from Alberta. You know, you were in Edmonton working as a national reporter out there, and this is where we saw these tremendous wildfires. And I don't mean tremendous in a good way. I mean, it was staggering, the images uh, that we saw. And yet, it, it, say it's one of the provinces that pushes back the most against a lot of the climate measures. You know, it, it, Shane in Winnipeg wrote us about the disconnect, as he sees it, between the politics of Premier Smith and Moe and Pierre Polyev and sort of the reality of climate change in his view. This is a, a fraught one politically. It is, and I think there is a lot of hay being made about, you know, affordability is a bigger issue than climate change right now, as, as many of my colleagues have noted. However, at one point, the, the cost of repairing homes that were destroyed by wildfires or in floods in Atlantic Canada to, to broaden this out to beyond Alberta, yep. that's going to be a bigger affordability issue. And, and I think that will make climate change a, a hot topic again. I, I, I remember asking the federal government, how much do you think these repairs are going to cost when, when, when the stuff in Atlantic Canada was going down? And they, they didn't have an answer. Like, yeah. they're like, yeah. an untold billions of dollars. I mean, well, well, and on that, going back to our, our first topic on, on food prices, climate change is driving up the price, like exactly. too much water, too little water. Floods and droughts it affects it all, right? Precisely, yeah. yeah. Catherine, you uh, well, I was going to say the, the federal government has put $2 billion this year towards their adaptation fund to try to deal with this. But everybody will tell you, speak to mayors across the country whose communities have been through some of these disasters, be it flooding, be it wildfires. It's not going to be nearly enough money. Um, Rosie raised the question earlier of the conservatives and what their stance is going to be on all of this. Pierre Polyev has not said uh, whether or not he will commit to the Paris targets uh, to fight climate change. In fact, essentially what we know about his plans to fight climate change, obviously the one uh, slogan that he's repeated perhaps more than any other, axe the, the tax. Uh, he wants to get rid of uh, the carbon tax, doesn't believe in carbon pricing. He does believe in, he says, technology, green technology as a means of dealing with this. But, you know, what does that look like? I, we had uh, Jenny Byrne on the House earlier this year in September, and I asked her, well, listen, the alternative is what Joe Biden's doing in the United States, right? Massive subsidies, yeah. which isn't necessarily such a conservative solution. Is that a route you would be willing to go? They don't want to talk about that right now. An election is perhaps two years out. They're not really broaching that subject. But at some point, there's going to have to be more substance there than technology. What does that look like? What is the role of the federal government in fostering it? And can that ever truly be enough to meet Canada's climate targets? So, so Rosie, on that point, right, if you wait until 2025 and an election sort of roll out your mm -hmm, plan, then mm -hmm. assume you win. You've got to get in, build up a cabinet, get it going, roll it out. It doesn't feel like there's enough time to get to the 2030 target if you get started in 2025. Sure, although we're having trouble now, right? Yeah. <laughs> With all the measures well, that within are in four place percentage as well. Yeah, points, yeah, right? yeah, but but we're not we're, we're still not there. Um, yeah, I mean, listen, they, they're, they're going to have to put something meaty on the table. It's going to have to be something that will get them um, at least as close as the Liberals' targets, a, a project would, um, if not further. I, I don't know what that would be, to Catherine's point. I don't know that technology is enough to do that, um, but nor do I know that everything that the Liberals have in place is enough. Right. I, I do know that there's people talking about it a lot more than the Conservatives are willing to talk about it. And I think at some point the rubber hits the road there for them, and I think that becomes a problem. There's a lot of people in Canada concerned about this, young people <laughs> would be top of mind, right, who, who are very concerned about the future of, of the world. And 
I, I think you have to start laying things out, and I, I think it probably has to be before an election campaign in order for it to be credible, because we've seen it, as I said, the past two elections, similar answers like this, kind of vague answers right. about what they're going to do, and it just wasn't enough. Now, what, what those leaders didn't have in the past was a very fatigued, long-in-the-tooth Justin Trudeau government, so maybe that'll be enough to push them through. Okay. All right, we're going to leave it there, but coming up, our reporters will answer more of your questions after this break. I'm Salima Shivji in Mumbai. The story that dominated my coverage in the second half of this year was, of course, the massive diplomatic rift between India and Canada. That's after Prime Minister Justin Trudeau told the House of Commons he had credible allegations that India was behind the killing of a Sikh activist on Canadian soil. The fallout was swift. The Indian government called the allegations absurd, and the anger that officials here had for Canada was on full display. Visa services for Canadians were suspended, Canadian diplomats forced to leave this country, and even after the United States filed an indictment alleging an Indian government official had instigated a failed murder-for-hire plot there, the India's stern reaction towards Canada hasn't really softened much. It's a major obstacle to Canada's foreign policy goals at a time when the West is looking to India as a possible counter to an aggressive China. Okay, welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics. Today we're answering your questions on the top political stories of the year. And here with me are the CBC's Rosemary Barton, Catherine Cullen, Rafi Bujikanian, Elise Von Scheel, and Katie Simpson. And that, of course, was our colleague Salima Shivji in India with more on a huge national and international story this year. So, Rosie, this, this, uh, this shook Parliament the day the Prime Minister uh, yeah. made his allegation. Where do you think we are on this now? I, I hate the word a bombshell in news, but this is, yeah, this is one that, that qualifies as that. When the Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons, said that there were credible allegations, said that it was they, they believed there was agents of the government of India that were involved in this assassination on Canadian soil of a Canadian man. It was a stunning uh, allegation to make. So stunning, I'll point out, David, that there were some people that didn't buy it. <laughs> right. And some people who said, I'd like to see the evidence, including the leader of the opposition. The, the, the facts that have come out since then, uh, as I, I know Katie will talk about more, have um, very much vindicated the, the Prime Minister's allegations and have certainly now put the pressure on India to either mm. respond to the demands from the Canadian government to participate in this investigation, um, to see whether arrests happen here on Canadian soil in, in regards to this murder, and then to see how other nations, like the U.S., for instance, help Canada get over this hump, diplomatic hump with India, who, at least at first blush, seems responsible for some sort of nefarious behavior. Right. And, and Katie, speaking of bombshells, there were the bombshell allegations in that U.S. indictment uh, that came out. Uh, where the murder of Hurdip Singh Niger, who was killed in, in, in British Columbia, was referenced, mentioned, and was just one of apparently many murder for hire plots on uh, North American soil. Yeah, and you know what? I hate saying it read like a movie script, this indictment. I hate saying that on TV, but guess what? It read like a movie script. Um, all of the detail that uh, the Americans put forward, uh, the American, the Department of Justice put forward in this allegation, absolutely stunning. Um, naming a suspect who was allegedly hired by uh, a, an employee of the government of India, uh, ordered to organize uh, executions or killings of uh, people that the Indian government allegedly wanted to target. Now, it hasn't been proven in... in in a court of law at this point, but the level of detail in the allegations just absolutely stunning. This suspect uh, telling undercover agents about three or four uh, killings that uh, apparently were being planned. Uh, the name of the Canadian who was killed uh, just in June coming up multiple times in this investigation. So again, a lot of people in Canada who are aching for some sort of detail, we saw some of those details and specifics in the allegations in the investigation that's going on in the United States. It's interesting, Rafi, because, you know, hanging over everything, is Russia because of the invasion of Ukraine. We ended the year talking about India, but your pick for the top story is how we started the year, talking about allegations of Chinese interference, the special rapporteur process, all of that. We got a question from Don McDougall saying, because that story has kind of fallen off the radar, saying, is it over? <laughs> Did Beijing interfere in our elections? Who are the leakers, <laughs> if you know? And, 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 and was David Johnston uh, vindicated by what's happened? I will say if 2023 was only six months long, this would have been everyone's top story of yeah, the year probably. because it's all we were talking about for a for good chunk of time. Now, um, it's not over. I can understand why John McDougall is asking that question, but we are, of course, sort of uh, midway through this process. Uh, David Johnston resigned from his role after not recommending a public inquiry. 
Nobody was happy about that except the Liberals. Now we are going to have one. It's already started with uh, Justice Marie-José Og, and we are expecting the really public part of that to start next year in January. As for whether or not uh, the former governor general was, was vindicated, <laughs> I, I, I imagine really that political observers will only weigh in on that once the inquiry is over. One of Johnston's criticisms was that whoever conducted a public inquiry would not really get any more information than he did because right. of how much of this information is classified, how much of it is top secret. You know, you might remember the last public inquiry we had, some of that was behind closed doors and we didn't have access to it as journalists. I suspect we'll see a little bit of that this time around as well. So we'll just have to wait and see, really. But this will come back shortly. In a few weeks, <laughs> right. it'll be big headlines again. Well, uh, Elise, I just wonder, this was a feeding frenzy in the first half of the year, as, as, um, as, as Rafi points out. Uh, I know the Indian al allegations and revelations certainly changed uh, the conversation around this in terms of the significance of what foreign interference could look like. How does it resonate outside of say, Ottawa and diaspora communities. I mean, what was your, what your take on, on this from your perch in Calgary all year? I think that it resonates for a lot of people because they watch what's gone on in the U.S. and wonder if some lesser version of it's happening here, right? right. It's the way it goes with U.S. politics. We watch it and we're like, well, are we 10 percent as dramatic as the U.S.? Is 10 percent of that going on here? And so I think the, the big question for voters across the country even people outside the Ottawa bubble is, will these questions be resolved to some level of satisfaction before the next election? And as we watch this, uh, this inquiry proceed and as we get information and as the government decides what they're going to do and as the, the report gets back on what they're even equipped to do or where they might have um, not been equipped to deal with in, in the past, I think voters are going to be looking at what is going to be different. And if we know now to some degree of um, of information that becomes public that this is going on, how it's going to be dealt with so that they can have confidence that at least we're aware of what we're dealing with and what's getting thrown at us during the next election. Yeah. Catherine, what do you think? Well, I mean, one thing, David, is that I think our definition of foreign interference has really expanded this mm -hmm. year. And obviously, <clears throat> we, we think about electoral interference as being what was front of mind at the beginning of the year. Certainly what Salima talked about, uh, the situation with India, is on a whole different level, right, when you have uh, allegations that a foreign government was involved in the killing of a Canadian citizen. That's a very different kind of interference. But we should also think of it as a thing that can be ongoing, certainly outside of the election period. I don't know, perhaps one of the most interesting words that I learned in 2023 was spamouflage, right? right. That yeah. allegation um, that uh, MP social media accounts were being hit by spam from a bunch of different sources, making allegations about those MPs. There are a lot of different ways to interfere with a democracy. There are a lot of different <coughs> forces out there that can be a Part of that. So I think it is definitely not over, even if it is not the main topic in the political discourse. And it's something that we need to keep an eye out and know that our governments and our security officials are also keeping an eye on. You know, Katie, just to bring it back to the India issue, for example, it's not just a country and a government accused of this. It's a country and a government that Western countries are counting on to be an important ally and a counterweight to China's intransigence and China's influence. How is the U.S. going to move forward with that, given what we've learned and, and, and what's been alleged uh, in those documents. The Biden administration really desperately wants to deepen ties with India in this moment. And that is because they want India to serve as a counterweight to China's growing influence. So all of this was happening in and around a massively significant date here in Washington, D.C. And that, of course, was the visit by Narendra Modi to Washington for a state dinner hosted by Joe Biden. Um, the investigation that was going on in the United States was happening behind the scenes as this show of support was taking place and this really this massive show of two countries trying to deepen ties the United States really trying to to, to uh, develop that relationship because again there is so much concern about China's growing influence and the deteriorating relationship between Washington and Beijing now moving forward the Biden administration has absolutely not abandoned those efforts uh, and they continue to try to work at that but behind the scenes quietly and a little bit publicly we've seen senior US officials urge India to cooperate with the ongoing investigations uh, and, uh, you know, saying in, in diplomatic speak, you know, this kind of behavior is not what democratic right. nations should be participating in. So the Americans are not giving up on this because they really want to develop that counterweight to China. But again, it makes things more difficult when you point to the allegations in this court document. So, so Rafi, the, the, the Chinese foreign interference allegations by the Chinese state, the Chinese government, we got a question about that from Bob Clark, who's 
from St. John, so I have to ask it. Uh, <laughs> he, he says, you know, in covering this story, did the media advance the objectives of the Chinese and other authoritarian governments to undermine our democracy in general, which was, I presume, he writes, their overriding objective? This is a tough one, right? Because writing about something doesn't mean you're endorsing it, you know, and you're covering it, but like it, it does feel like when you talk about complicated issues like this, it can rattle people's confidence, right? What's your sense on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a, you know, it, it's tricky because you want to be exposing what could be going on, so you report on it, and then people hear what's going on and go, well, that's that's not great about our democracy, so, well, what's the alternative? You can't you right. can't cover this up if you're if you're a journalist. You well, have to talk about the facts. And one of the challenges yeah. we have is that a lot of it was based on intelligence, yes. which we couldn't see and couldn't verify, and is not the same as evidence, right? Yes, intelligence we couldn't see and verify in some cases, documents that other media outlets may have been, you know, leaked um, mm -hmm. in an incomplete fashion or in a partial fashion, documents we didn't have access to, but right. we still have to report on it if, you know, politicians are being confronted with this issue, we, we, have, to, we have to follow up on that. And, yeah, it's, it's, it's dicey. I, I find it very hard getting into other reporters' bathwater on this <laughs> one stuff. Catherine, you got a final thought on that one? Ooh, <laughs> that's, a That's how better. I felt, though, you know? <laughs> um, listen, on the one hand, I would say the state of democracy, that is, you know, right there in the window in terms of what we do. It is an important topic, and I think as political reporters, we are all seized by it. I will say one moment in the coverage of all of this that was quite troubling for me was when we started to see those public opinion polls that suggested a significant number of Canadians thought the election had been stolen, right. that that's what the allegation was, when in fact you had no political party in Canada making that allegation. So there are things that, you know, I try to be mindful of. I think a lot of us do as we report on this, uh, making sure that people really understand the core of what's going on here, what is and isn't being alleged, uh, and that by having these discussions, we hope that the ultimate result is to strengthen those institutions and avoid problems in the future. Because as Rafi said, it's not going to go away just because you don't look at it, right? Right. Okay, we're going to take another quick break, but our panel will be back to answer your questions about what it's like to cover politics. Come back for that. <laughs> Welcome back to a special edition of Power and Politics. Today, we're answering some of your questions on the top political stories of the year. Here with me are the CBC's Rosemary Barton, Catherine Cullen, Rafi Buchikanian, Elise Von Scheel, and Katie Simpson. Okay, I want to start with this question from Mark Sturman from Somerville, Massachusetts. We have an international <laughs> audience here. It says, as a U.S. citizen with a strong interest in politics in both Washington and Ottawa, I'm increasingly worried about the prospects of the federations in our nations disintegrating. Do you agree that democracy is essentially on the ballot in 2020? 2024 and 2025. All right, Katie, I'm going to start with you on that. I'm not going to ask you to be that definitive, but this kind of ties into your top story of Donald Trump and, and what he said he would do on day one and the concerns being raised about a possible sequel in the White House. When people reveal themselves, the number one rule is listen to what they say and who they tell you when they tell you who they are. Uh, Donald Trump making that offhand comment that he would be dictator for a day, uh, only to drill, to, uh, you know, drill oil, and uh, uh, he says, and, uh, but... You know, it's a comment that has really resonated here in Washington, D.C. Uh, given all of the speculation about what a second Trump term could look like and concerns that there would be no guardrails in place, that Donald Trump would surround himself with the people who share his vision for America and that the so-called adults in the room who sort of kept things on the rails in the last administration, they wouldn't be involved in something like this. My top story of the year that I picked was the historic four indictments of Donald yeah. Trump a former president, and now the front runner to become the next Republican presidential nominee. Um, you know, you have the charges in New York related to hush money payments to a porn star. Um, you have the classified documents investigation in Miami. You have charges related to January 6th and efforts to steal the last election. And then, of course, you have the investigation ongoing, the charges related to a similar investigation in the state of Georgia, efforts to overturn election results in that state. Um, it is historic. It is mm. uh, 
hugely, massively important. And you know what? It's not exactly surprising. It was these charges were all expected, but watching them unfold and the the great unknown that comes with these charges, what the next election campaign is going to look like, it is really going to push the boundaries of U.S. democracy and the American justice system. And so Democrats are campaigning on the fact that if Donald Trump does become the nominee for the Republican Party, they are going to make this a front and center part of their election campaign. Uh, Joe Biden and the White House already trying to do that. And uh, a lot of uh, anti-Trump Republicans are also getting on that bandwagon, bandwagon warning what could happen in the neck after the next election should it be Donald Trump who returns to the White House. Liz Cheney, a former Republican congresswoman, even going so far as saying 2024 might be the last U.S. election you vote in if it is Donald Trump who is elected back and sent back to the White House. And she says, I don't say that lightly. She isn't joking. Uh, the question is, Donald Trump, will he, if he is reelected and put back in the White House, uh, will he continue to push sort of the boundaries of uh, American democracy? And so in the United States, I would say it is a legitimate question right. and it is a legitimate concern, especially given the violence we saw around January 6th. Elise, I, I wonder if I could... Not, not necessarily deal with that part of, of Mark's question, but what he said, his worry about the prospects of the federations in our nations disintegrating. You're in Alberta, the, the anger out there over federal policy, the invocation of the Sovereignty Act, similar thing in, in Saskatchewan. Do you think we might be getting to the point of constitutional crises between the federal and provincial governments? Where do you think this potentially goes? I think it's important to draw a line between autonomy policies and separatist policies. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, even looking at the Sovereignty Act, right, Premier Daniel Smith was careful to put within a united Canada <laughs> into the bill title. Um, I think the same thing you'd see in Saskatchewan, like everybody's pretty mad at the federal government. I think fairly the federal government's probably a little angry back, but nobody's walking out to the border with a saw. Um, and so I don't think that we're at maybe the crisis level um, that the, the U.S. might be in, in terms of like what's happening and, and how it proceeds from there. But I will say that there are people, especially out here, who question um, what the future is between that relationship between the provinces and the federal government. And there's so much overlap in the policies that they care about, health care, you know, uh, energy and environment. And so I think that as you move forward with some of those policies and some of these fights, people are wondering what the path forward looks like and how that might change if the government at the federal level changes and whether you'd mm. see maybe a more toned down version of the provincial governments out west here. Well, all of this takes is sort of changing the tone of politics a bit, which brings us to Tim Creelman's question. He goes, I see a hard shift toward what he calls an American style hatred of the other side and political interactions. Politicians don't just respectfully disagree any longer, rather the opponent is demonized. Uh, Rosie, certainly it's, it's been a, an angrier year in Ottawa than any year I remember since I got here. Yeah, I've been here a long time. People get angry <laughs> pretty easily. I, I, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to judge. I, 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 don't, I don't love doing that comparison because there have been difficult times. I'll, I'll point to an event that happened towards the end of this year where at, after that all-night voting marathon when Justin Trudeau walked across the aisle and hugged Shannon Stubbs, the, the energy critic for the Conservatives, who, who is deeply partisan. Yes. I'm not saying that's meaningful, but I'm saying that if, if there was a real hatred of the enemy, you probably wouldn't see them engaging that way. Yes, things are bad. Things are toxic. Uh, social media is a huge contributor to that. People are being able to speak inside their own vacuums and not hear anybody else's perspective is a big problem. That's, that's a problem that is not just... Um, happening in, in Parliament. It's a problem that's happening across the country. You know, people need to be open to hearing other perspectives and other viewpoints in order to understand them. Um, and and that, that is a deeply concerning thing. Is it something that we can overcome? Probably. Probably. Mm -hmm. But you need to have the right um, leadership in order to do that. And, and so I, I do worry about the next election and whether it devolves into something pretty nasty where, where no one is listening to one another. And where, because of the desperate nature of people trying to win, yeah. either cling on to power or get there, um, it, it becomes quite polarizing. Yeah. Rafi, uh, what's your sense? Is this a new permanent feature of our politics, or is it just angry times leads to angry politics, and this, this could pass? I mean, I recognize that Justin Trudeau hugged Chan and stuff, so I was actually <laughs> got to mention that, too. I have a hard time imagining him hugging Pierre Polyev, right? 
Depends what he's trying to do, I suppose. <laughs> I mean, if he's trying to suplex him, maybe, you know? But yeah, no, I got you. I, I, I just think that the, the rhetoric between the, the two leaders of, of the main parties has gotten ratcheted up so much mm -hmm. that it's going to be really hard to come back down from, certainly not before the next election anyway. Catherine, what's your thoughts on this one? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a difficult question, and if I'm being honest, it depends on the day that you ask mm -hmm. me, David. Like, it, it uh, sometimes I'm of a mind that it is cyclical. The politics are cyclical, and we see these um, rises in anger when there are uh, a lot of pressure on the public for a variety of reasons, be they, you know, economic. But then there are also things like social media, and you talk to people who've been in the House of Commons for a long time, and some of them are going to tell you this is as bad as it's ever been. So um, it is certainly a difficult time. I have hope that there I know there are still places where we can still talk to each other. I, I think right. that that's something that uh, all of us actually as political reporters have moments where we have uh, respectful conversations or we see respectful conversations between people of different parties and and we can have respectful conversations about people with people where there are areas of difference. So uh, I'm going to I'm going to cling to hope at the end of this answer. <laughs> okay, I, I'm going to stick with you because uh, yeah. we got a lot of questions about mm -hmm. Pierre Polyev and his relationship with the media, speaking yeah. of the ability to speak together and, yeah. and work together, and whether how we should approach as a profession fact-checking him. What are your thoughts on the dynamic of the leader of the opposition and the old-school mainstream media of Canada? Well, listen, I understand why we're getting these questions. Clearly, Mr. Polyev has at times taken a very confrontational approach. Um, you know, we've seen it in particular scrums where he really uh, takes issue with the reporter, the question, and, mm. and really hammers at it. That is his prerogative. Everybody around this table, we're members of the media, we believe in the importance of asking tough questions to people in power, people who aspire to be in power. That's an important part of our job. It's his prerogative to push back. Uh, we are not immune from criticism or scrutiny, and I don't think there's anyone in the media who would suggest that we are. Our responsibility, though, as journalists, is to cover Mr. Polyev and the Conservatives without fear or favor. That is what we do with every political party, is what we will continue to do with him, uh, particularly as polls have him poised to, at this point, right. looks like be the next Prime Minister of Canada. Fact-checking is an important part of that work. It, it's part of what we do. It is something we are going to continue to do. R Rafi, since I got this job, I've become a house cat, right? I don't get to go out and go to the news conferences that Pierre Polyev holds. How, how do you deal with it when, uh, how do reporters deal with it as a profession? When, when he does the turn it around and criticize and attack the media, what, what do you think the best approach there is? So this has not happened to me at this point, right. but I feel like the ideal response is to not engage in a kind of debate with any politician you're covering and just stick to saying, well, this was my question to you and, and perhaps repeat the question if you feel like there was there was no answer there. I mean, I've, I've, I have done that with, with other politicians. It hasn't really come up with Mr. Polyevri yet, but I feel like that's what you should do. You shouldn't start answering his questions. I mean, that's not the journalist's role, really, right. right? Unless you're an opinion commentator, and they are rarely in scrums. Right. <laughs> Rosie, uh, uh, just wrap it up uh, on this one for us. How do, you, how do you think the media should approach this whole new dynamic? Uh, you know, I, I wouldn't disagree with what Catherine's saying in any way. We, yeah. You know, we have encountered parts of this before in Ottawa. Stephen Harper, at the beginning uh, of his time as prime minister, did not enjoy the media. I did one interview with Stephen Harper uh, during my entire time in Ottawa and his entire time as prime minister. It went just fine for both of us. I would say that it is important for journalists to keep asking questions. It is important for politicians to continue appearing on programs and answering those questions. Okay, uh, we're going to end with a quick go around from each of you on the big story that you're watching for in 2024. I'm, I'm going to start with Elise, if I can. Elise, uh, with Daniel Smith, it could be any number of stories on any number of <laughs> topics. What, 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 what do you got your eye on? I think for me, it's, and maybe it's not like a super clear answer on one topic, but I think for me, I'm going to be watching how, as the affordability crisis starts to abate a little bit, what issue moves up to take up that space in the vacuum, right? Mm. Whether we look at healthcare, whether we look at environment and energy measures that we talked about, what kind of moves up to fill that space and which political party is able to effectively pivot to be the one that champions that issue in a way that we've seen the conservatives be successful on affordability up to this point. Katie, uh, you're going to have a really busy 2024. <laughs> is, is it the election, and, and what else could it possibly be? <laughs> Ooh, what would it be? 
What could it be? The election. It's yeah. going to be bonkers. Uh, uh, we're going to be out on the road, so make sure you're tuning in to CBC News, cbcnews.ca, and all of your appropriate CBC programs. <laughs> David, I'll come on your show. Rosie, I'll come on your show. <laughs> Catherine, I'll come on your show, too. Um, so we are going to be traveling. We're going to be talking to Americans. We are going to be um, trying to better understand why Americans are making the choices they're making mm. and the bigger picture implications, not just for this country, but of course for Canada. Uh, for Amer When I say this country, I mean I'm sitting in Washington right now. Right, right, right. <laughs> bigger picture uh, yeah. implications for America and Canada and the world. Yeah, yeah, it is a super <laughs> consequential election. Catherine, what are you watching for in 2024? I'm going to say uh, the big story, the prime minister's political future. And I don't just mean the uh, old walk in the snow and whether or not he's going to take one, but the fact that he is low in the polls right now. What is the prime minister going to try to do about it? How is his caucus going to respond if that low in the polls uh, status stays in place? I think there are a whole bunch of interesting questions about where Justin Trudeau and the Liberal Party go from here. Rafi? This will be shocking, but foreign interference. I'm going. I'm. I'm really curious to see what this public inquiry ends up looking like when we get to the public hearing section of it. There have been a lot of questions about whether uh, Justice O could broaden her mandate to include more of India, perhaps, or go beyond the 2019 and 2021 elections, because that that's what we see in writing in her mandate. And when we've asked those questions to, say, Public Safety Minister Dominic LeBlanc, he typically says, "Well." She's allowed to do what, what she, she wants, wants because yeah. she's independent of government. So, you know, we don't really have an answer as to what the hearings will include. And um, I'm, I'm really curious to see how that all shakes out. Yeah, the findings, the recommendations are going to be critical with their own election exactly. coming up. Rosie, last word to you. Well, Catherine stole mine, frankly. So oh. I'll, I'll, choose, I'll choose the flip side of that coin. And, that, and that's the conservatives. I, I think that they've had an enormous amount of success in the polls. With success in the polls comes increased scrutiny and increased demand for clear answers on what you're going to do. And as we get closer to an election, those things have to start happening, I think, in a real way. So how do the conservatives respond to that? How do we make sure that, how do they make sure that they didn't peak too soon? And mm -hmm. then how does Pierre Poiliev continue to uh, demonstrate to Canadians that he is the person that he says he is and that he can, in fact, be the next prime minister? It's the other side of Catherine's yeah. coin, but both, to me, are really important stories. Yeah, and, and on both of those, the liberals are kind of counting on the country can't stay angry until 2025. <laughs> we'll find out in 2024. <laughs> All right, that's it for a special edition of Power and Politics. Thank you to Catherine, Rosie, Rafi, Elise, and Katie. I'm David Cochran. Thank you all so much for watching. There's lots more coming up on CBC News Network, so stay with us.